Hello, and welcome to Historia Ecclesiastica. My name is Daniel Sudi, and in this Questions in Church History episode, we are going to be looking at the question of whether or not people are fundamentally good, responding to the current controversy uh, caused by the comments of Pope Francis in a 60 Minutes interview about a month ago. Um, we're going to weigh in with um, the traditional understanding of human nature, according to the Catholic Church, as well as the traditional understanding of human nature, according to uh, Calvinist-inspired Protestantism. And we'll be looking at um, both Scripture and the Church Fathers' response to that question of whether or not people are fundamentally good. Please like the video, share, and subscribe. I would greatly appreciate it. We'll begin with a prayer, which comes from the Holy Saturday Liturgy in the Latin Rite. This is the prayer after the first reading, option B, which tells the story of the creation of Adam and Eve. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. O God, who wonderfully created human nature and still more wonderfully redeemed it, grant us, we pray, to set our minds against the enticements of sin, that we may merit to attain eternal joys through Christ our Lord, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Okay, so in this video, we're going to begin by looking at the recent papal comments made regarding the fundamental goodness of human beings. Uh, once again, these, these comments were made by the Holy Father in the middle of May, but they are still a hot topic on social media, so it's uh, worth looking into. We will look at understanding these comments in the light of Catholic tradition, as well as understanding Protestant criticism of these comments in the light of the Calvinist oral tradition of what's called total depravity. We will weigh both anthropologies, both the traditional Catholic anthropology and the traditional total depravity Calvinist anthropology against the standard of sacred scripture, especially the words of Jesus and the teachings of the church fathers. So it'll follow the same format that all questions in church history um, videos take, where we, we look at the question, we look at both sides, then we look at scripture and the earliest church traditions regarding the question. So let's begin by diving right in by looking at uh, the comments that the Holy Father made during this 60 Minutes interview. At one point he said, quote, people want to live, people forge ahead, and people are fundamentally good. We are all fundamentally good. Yes, there are some rogues and sinners, but the heart itself is good. Okay, so those are the words that inspire lots of controversy, especially when Pope Francis said the words people are fundamentally good, and then clarifying what he meant by that by saying the heart itself is good. Okay, so before we begin looking at um, the anthropological system from which Pope Francis made these comments and the anthropological system with which Protestants, uh, different Protestant influencers have criticized these comments, let's talk about a few caveats. Okay, there is a definite limitation to engaging in a theological debate based on comments Pope Francis gives in unofficial interviews. This has been a common theme on social media throughout his entire papacy. Um, and this is not to say that, uh, you know, the Pope or anybody else is not responsible for what they say during an interview. Um, if, if somebody says something during an interview that's objectionable, people have the right to object to it. Um, but to be clear, when Pope Francis speaks in interviews, he is consistently choosing to speak in a conversational tone rather than a theologically precise um, kind of exegetical language. Okay, Pope Francis clearly personally uh, believes there is a great pastoral effectiveness to conversing in a sort of normal kind of everyday type of way with uh, interviewers, especially with the press. He thinks that there's an advantage to that, which which he tries to take advantage of. Um, However, Pope Francis does speak in theologically precise languages uh, in his encyclicals. So it would be, you know, more fruitful if you want to engage in a philosophical or a theological debate with the thought of Pope Francis to try to look at one of his encyclicals, open one of those, actually read it. They're usually only about 100 pages long. They're not difficult to read. Um, you know, 
making hour-long videos about a comment he makes in a 60-minute interview, well, he's not trying to be extremely theologically precise here. He's trying to just talk to somebody like, you know, you or I would, would talk at a, at a coffee shop or, or whatnot. So just keep that in mind. Um, this is not the most fruitful way to engage with the thought of Pope Francis, but at the same time, social media influencers don't typically really want to open up, you know, one of his actual encyclicals and, and read his actual, you know, laid out precise theological thought. So once again, to clarify, I'm not saying that someone is off the hook if they say something in an interview that's objectionable. I'm just saying it's not really the best way to engage with the personal theological thought of Pope Francis by just constantly nitpicking his you know, words in interviews. Um, now, at the same time, these words uh, we're going to look at, there's not too much to object from a sound scriptural and traditional Christian perspective, but uh, we'll look at why certain Christians have found um, so much to object to in those words. So we have to really look at um, what words the Pope used. When he said people are good, he said people are fundamentally good. Okay, so we have to look at first of all, before we look at anything else, what does it mean? Uh, what does he mean by using the word fundamental? Okay. Uh, this is just one example, I'm not saying that Stanford University is the ultimate authority on philosophy or anything like that, but, but it's just a useful example to look at. The word fundamentality, according to the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, means the basic or primitive concept behind a reality. To be precise, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy referred to fundamentality as the most basic or primitive concepts behind all of reality, but um, I'm applying that to this specific um, concept of the reality of man, the reality of human beings. Pope Francis said they are fundamentally good. And so what he is saying is at the most basic and primitive concept of what it means to be human, Pope Francis is saying there is fundamental goodness there. Okay. So what does it mean to say that at a fundamental level, at the most basic and primitive core of what a human is, both generally speaking and specifically each individual human, uh, that they are good? What claim is Pope Francis making? He is saying that at the core of their beings, humans are ontologically good. Okay, so the word ontological means the nature of what something is. Pope Francis is saying in this interview that at the ontological, um, at the ontological level, at the core of their beings, humans are good. Okay, rather than ontologically evil. Evil is the opposite of good in the metaphysical sense. Now he used the words the word the heart is good. Okay. So in Catholic tradition, the heart is the innermost essence of who someone is. So we can ask, is my deepest and truest essence of who I am ontologically good or ontologically evil? That's what the heart is. So is the deepest essence of who I am good or is the deepest essence of who I am evil? That is the question. And this question is essential to one sense of anthropology. Anthropology is the study of man, the study of humanity. So Catholic anthropology and Calvinist anthropology and John Calvin being arguably the most influential Protestant theologian since the vast majority of Protestant sects in the United States descend from Calvinist theology rather than Lutheranist uh, Lutheran theology. Um, so Catholic anthropology and Calvinist anthropology answer the question of whether or not the heart of a person or the ontological, yeah, the, the, um, the heart of a person is good or evil. Catholic anthropology states that humans are fundamentally good. In other words, at the core of their being, the essence of humans are good, while still being dramatically damaged and corrupted by original sin, they are still good at the, in the deepest sense possible. Calvinist theology subscribes to what is called total depravity. So John Calvin believed in original sin, and he believed the effects of original sin depraved the human being all the way down to the 
deepest depths of their essence so that there was nothing naturally good left in human beings after original sin. There is no natural virtue remaining in a human heart. The only way that virtue can be uh, grown in a human heart after original sin, according to John Calvin, was if grace was infused into that heart. And of course, secular anthropology, if you were to study anthropology in a university, would just say that humans are fundamentally animals. Uh, they are not good. They are not evil. They are f merely animals that are seeking to survive. And the advice they would give us is just to pursue our own worldly happiness above all else. So we're not looking at secular anthropology's answer to this question of whether or not the person is fundamentally good. The only anthropologies that can coherently answer that question in the affirmative or the negative would be Catholic anthropology and Calvinist anthropology. So let's take a look at Catholic anthropology just to lay out what a system of thought Pope Francis is emerging from when he makes these comments before we then look at um, the opposite, the Calvinist anthropology, and then we'll weigh both against the standards of scripture and early church tradition. Once again, anthropology is the study of man. And I have laid out here seven points that kind of all of Catholic anthropology hinge upon. Each one is supported by Catechism of the Catholic Church paragraphs, which is the official summation of Catholic uh, doctrine as promulgated by the Magisterium today. First point, Catholic anthropology is absolutely rooted in the belief in an objective human nature, which was designed by God to be not just good, but very good. Genesis 1.31, and please see Catechism of the Catholic Church 356 through 362. Second point, Catholics believe that this very good human nature was designed with a heart which was oriented towards and capable of sharing in the sanctifying grace or sharing in the divine life of God. That's Catechism of the Catholic Church 356. Point three, original sin is central to understanding the condition of the post-Eden man. While created fundamentally good, since Adam and Eve renounced the life of God within their souls, they were incapable of passing on the gift of sanctifying grace to their progeny. They no longer had sanctifying grace in their own souls, and when they conceived children, they did not pass on the gift of sanctifying grace to them, naturally speaking. So that the words conception without sanctifying grace is nearly synonymous with saying conception with original sin. Original sin could be understood foremost as being conceived without any sanctifying grace. The soul is like a great furnace, which was created to host the fire of the Holy Spirit and the life of the Trinity. However, these furnaces are still created when a newborn is conceived, or a newly conceived is conceived, I guess, but the furnace is empty. There is no fire of the Trinity within the furnace of the newly conceived soul. The fire of the Holy Trinity must be reinfused into the furnace of the soul of the child once they are baptized. They are not conceived with that life of God within them naturally. See Catechism of the Catholic Church 397 through three through 405, and we're going to look at the effects of original sin in the next few slides as well. I'll be reading quite a few catechism um, sections. Okay, point four of Catholic anthropology. Adam and Eve's sin had literal spiritual consequences on the condition of their human souls. And so they didn't only lack sanctifying grace, but they were harmed and in a sense bent out of shape by the sin they had committed. So this condition of being bent out of shape in the manner of their first sin was passed down in the conception of the souls of their progeny. Because of the failed spiritual fatherhood and motherhood of Adam and Eve, all their children have inherited an inclination to imitate their sins, especially their sins of pride, trying to be like God, envy, once again, trying to possess and grasp for the divinity of God, as well as the distrust of God and the shame of oneself being fully revealed. So this inclination to sin in the manner that Adam and Eve sinned, that we are all conceived with because our souls are all in a sense damaged and bent out of shape, similar to how you might say as an analogy, um, someone could have a damaged uh, gene and they could pass down that damaged gene when they conceive a child. We all have this damaged soul from the uh, damage that our 
first parents did in the Garden of Eden. And that damage is called concupiscence. Concupiscence is the inclination to sin. You can read about it in CCC 405 and 406. Point five of Catholic anthropology. While baptism restores sanctifying grace, it does not restore the original state of the pre-fallen soul. So we still have the effects of original sin. We still are in a morphed state of concupiscence in the spiritual level as an effect of that original sin. Once again, see CCC 405 and 406. Point number six. While fallen, mankind has not become totally depraved. Okay, the souls of humans are in fact inclined to sin even after baptism. We still have concupiscence and the effects of original sin. But at an even deeper level than our concupiscence, so in a sense at the fundamental level, our souls and our hearts are still inclined to pursue the transcendentals of goodness, truth, and beauty. And we still have the freedom of soul to do what is good and that is the key difference between catholic anthropology and calvinist is that according to calvinist anthropology the soul can do nothing good without grace and so the soul does not have free will because if you can't do good without grace your soul does not have the faculty of freedom anymore Okay, you cannot choose the good freely if you cannot do so naturally. So Catholic anthropology still states that the soul has the freedom to choose the good, um, even though it has been very inclined and bent towards choosing the evil, it still does have the free ability to choose the good. Okay, point number seven of Catholic anthropology. Oh, and you could see uh, CCC 1730 through 1742 for that point about um, the effects of original sin. And then finally, point seven. The process of sanctification objectively restores the soul to its original glorious design. This process of sanctification hopefully is completed in this world, but if it is not completed before our death, it will be completed before entering heaven in the temporary state of purgatory. Sanctification does not merely cover our sins in a legalistic technicality, as if it were snow covering a dung hole, a popular analogy that Catholics use to kind of poke fun at total depravity. Because if um, in the Calvinist system, the soul is not really sanctified, it's just legally um, forgiven. And so it's as, uh, it is as though the purity of Jesus kind of covers the dung of our souls, but doesn't actually fix it. Um, that dung hole analogy is often attributed to uh, John Calvin and Martin Luther. Or rather, this analogy is often attributed to Martin Luther um, alone. Um, however, in, it's it's generally considered to be a misquote. Luther never actually used that analogy. And um, here I have an article by Dave Armstrong, Catholic apologist, and a, I've been to his house. Just his entire living room is covered with books by Martin Luther. He studied a lot of Martin Luther, um, and uh, as a part of his apologetics, um, he, that's not a he, he he argues in this article that Luther never actually said that. So, but regardless, it it, it is an interesting analogy um, to try to to try to just poke at what um, total depravity suggests about uh, the process of sanctification or the lack of it in the uh, Calvinist or Lutheran system. Okay, so now let's look at some catechism quotes that really highlight how original sin has damaged and corrupted the soul of all human beings, the souls of all human beings, but has not left the souls of all human beings in a state of total depravity and incapacity to do good. So Catechism of the Catholic Church 397. Man, tempted by the devil, let his trust in the Creator die in his heart, and, abusing his freedom, disobeyed God's command. This is what man's first sin consisted of. All subsequent sin would be disobedience toward God and a lack of trust in his goodness. 398. In that sin, man preferred himself to God, and by that very act scorned him. He chose himself over and against God, against the requirements of his creaturely status, and therefore against his own good. Constituted in a state of holiness, man was destined to be fully divinized by God and glory. Seduced by the devil, he wanted to be like God, but without God, before God, and not in accordance with God. 399. Scripture portrays the tragic consequences of this first disobedience. Adam and Eve immediately lost the gift, lost the grace of original holiness. They become afraid of the God whom they have conceived a distorted of whom they have conceived a distorted image, that of a God jealous of his prerogatives. 
400. The harmony in which they had found themselves, thanks to original justice, is now destroyed. The control of the soul's spiritual faculties over the body is shattered. The union of man and woman becomes subject to tensions, their relations henceforth marked by lust and domination. Harmony with creation is broken. Visible creation has become alien and hostile to man. Because of man, creation is now subject to its bondage to decay. Finally, the consequence explicitly foretold for this disobedience will come true. Man will return to the ground, for out of it he was taken. Death makes its entrance into human history. 401. After that first sin, the world is virtually inundated in by sin. There is Cain's murder of his brother Abel, and the universal corruption which follows in the wake of sin. Likewise, sin frequently manifests itself in the history of Israel, especially as infidelity to the God of the covenant, and as transgression of the law of Moses. And even after Christ's atonement, sin raises its head in countless ways among Christians. Scripture and the church's tradition continually recall the presence and universality of sin in man's history. What Revelation makes known to us is confirmed by our own experience. For when man looks into his own heart, he finds that he is drawn towards what is wrong and sunk in many evils which cannot come from his good creator. Often refusing to acknowledge God as his source, man has also upset the relationship which should link him to his last end. And at the same time, he has broken the right order that should reign within himself, as well as between himself and other men and all creatures. The Catechism tells us to find evidence of concupiscence in our own experience, because it says here, For when man looks into his own heart, he finds that he is drawn to what is wrong. The consequences of Adam's sins for humanity. So this is what the church teaches about how the souls of all human beings were corrupted by Adam's sin. Corruption, but not total depravity. 402. All men are implicated in Adam's sin, as St. Paul affirms. By one man's disobedience, many, that is all men, were made sinners. Sin came into this world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all men sinned. The apostle contrasts the universality of sin and deal with the universality of salvation in Christ. Then, as one man's trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one man's act of righteousness leads to acquittal and life for all men. Following St. Paul, the church has always taught that the overwhelming misery which oppresses men and their inclination towards evil and death cannot be understood apart from their connection with Adam's sin, and the fact that he has tra transmitted to us a sin with which we are all born afflicted, a sin which is the death of the soul. Because of this certainty of faith, the church baptizes for the remission of sins even tiny infants who have not committed personal sin. But how did the sin of Adam become the sin of all his descendants? The whole human race is in Adam as one body of one man. By this unity of the human race, all men are implicated in Adam's sin, as all are implicated in Christ's justice. So as the originator of human nature, Adam had a lot more influence over human nature in a spiritual sense, um, because all men were inside of him. In the, the unity of the human race was found inside of him. Still, the transmission of original sin is a mystery that we cannot fully understand. But we do know by revelation that Adam had received original holiness and justice, not for himself alone, but for all of human nature. By yielding to the tempter, Adam and Eve committed a personal sin. But this sin affected the human nature that they would tra then transmit in a fallen state. It is a sin which will be transmitted by propagation to all mankind, that is, by the transmission of a human nature deprived of original holiness and justice. And that is why original sin is called sin, only in an alleg uh, analogical sense. It is a sin contracted and not committed, a state of the soul, I'm adding the words of the soul, and not an act. Although it is proper to each individual, Original sin does not have the character of a personal fault in any of Adam's descendants. It is the deprivation of original holiness and justice. But human nature has not been totally corrupted. It is wounded in the natural powers proper to it, subject to ignorance, suffering, and the dominion of death, and inclined to sin, an inclination to evil that is called concupiscence. Baptism, by imparting the life of Christ's grace, erases original sin and turns men back towards God. But the consequences for nature weakened and inclined to evil, persist in man and summon him to a spiritual battle. In this uh, paragraph 406, it's talking about how St. Augustine helped develop the church's precise understanding of original sin when he was uh, disputing with Pelagius, who we'll look at in just a moment here. Um, and then it references the Protestant Reformation, deformation. 
It says right here, the first Protestant reformers, on the contrary, taught that original sin has radically perverted man and destroyed his freedom, they, his freedom, his ability to choose the good in a natural sense. They identified the sin inherited by each man with the tendency to evil, concupiscentia, which would be insurmountable. So they taught that concupiscence was insurmountable. The church pronounced on the meaning of the data of revelation on original sin, especially in the Second Council of Orange in 529 AD and at the Council of Trent in 1546. Okay. Now, let's relook at Pope Francis's comments now. People want to live, people forge ahead, and people are fundamentally good. We are all fundamentally good. So fundamentally, in the deepest ontologically sense, we are still good, even though original sin has greatly harmed us. I'm adding words there. Yes, there are some rogues and sinners, but the heart itself is good. Okay, so objections to Pope Francis's comments now. Okay, I'll look at the arguments of Allie Beth Stuckey, popular Protestant social influencer, because she had a very popular video, um, very displeased with Pope Francis's comments. So here are some quotes from her. She said, some comments which he made were so blatantly wrong and unbiblical, it's actually incredible, and it makes me very sad. So that's how she introduced uh, Pope Francis' comments. She acknowledged that he did say everyone was sinners just before he left this uh, quote, but she could not understand how he could, quote, contradict himself and say that people were fundamentally good just a few moments later. So her inability to understand how Pope Francis could say that everyone was sinners and then a moment later say everyone was fundamentally good is simply because she cannot understand how someone could be a sinner but still be good in the deepest ontological sense because she believes that the theory of total depravity is um, the only way to process, basically, concupiscence, original sin, and uh, the fallen state of man. She actually shirked at the idea that uh, many Catholics had indicated to her that her um, arguments were, were dependent on the theory of total depravity, and um, she claimed that the fact that Catholics who were debating her were bringing up John Calvin and Martin Luther and total depravity was an evidence that they were theologically incompetent because they could not directly respond to the scripture verses that she had quoted um, without blaming Protestant theologians for her theories. So she's saying, I, I, th I think her words were, I think that speaks more to the breadth of your theological knowledge if you feel the need to talk about John Calvin while all I'm doing is quoting scripture. And she was assuming that Catholics who were debating her were ignoring the Bible verses and just trying to push them aside. Um, by bringing up John Calvin. What she's not understanding when she said that is that Catholics were hearing the Bible verses she was saying, and Catholics, of course, accept the Bible is divinely inspired. But what Catholics were saying was, yes, but those verses you're saying, those do not point to the idea that people are fundamentally evil. You believe that, and you interpret the, those verses you named in that light because you subscribe to Calvin's uh, interpretive tradition of total depravity. Um, Protestants always believe that they are only reading scripture and that's it. They, they believe they actually believe in sola scriptura, but they do not believe in sola scriptura. Nobody does. Okay. Protestants subscribe to the oral tradition of Calvin or the oral tradition of Luther rather than the holy apostolic tradition that dates back to the 12 apostles and our Lord. They use the tradition of Calvin, in this instance, his tradition of total depravity, which he generated, sui generis, or rather as a distortion of Catholic tradition of original sin. But, but they rely on that tradition to interpret scripture. So she quotes these different verses, and she interprets them as supporting total depravity, but, you know, they're not supporting total depravity. That's her interpretation. She said that Mark chapter 10, verse 18 says that no one is good but God alone. John chapter 8, verse 34 says we are a slave to sin. Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 9 says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. All these things are true. Um, when Jesus said no one is good but God unknown, he is saying that um, God is the essence and the source of all goodness. He it could be named good. That could be one of his names because um, Jesus answered that question when somebody called him good. And Jesus said, why are you calling me good? No one is good but God alone. Jesus is saying that goodness originates from God. Um, John chapter 8, verse 34 
um, being a slave to sin. Yeah, the, anyone who sins does become a slave to sin. Um, that doesn't mean they don't have the capacity of free will, um, but, but they have become uh, a sinner through their own choice, and they become a slave to it through their own choice. We're going to look more at these verses in a minute. I don't want to get too into them right here because I'm going to look at each one of these in a moment. Um, and so we're going to we're going to just step aside from that for a moment. I want to look at something else she said here. She said, there is a difference between saying a creation is good, a creation is well made, it is good because God made it. We are good because we are made in God's image. Therefore, we have value. We have innate worth. There is a difference between that and morally good. A grammatical error was in the original video. And I know that you all know that. There is a difference between moral good and a good creation. Missing. Uh, so so here she's, she's saying that she's only really recognizing two different ways that a human can be good. A human can be a good creation, which she agrees with, or a human could be morally good, which she disagrees with. She doesn't think anyone uh, passes the test of being morally good. Now, she's not referencing being fundamentally good or ontologically good, because she doesn't have that philosophical framework, probably. She, she did not have the tool to interpret Pope Francis's comments as referring to the ontological essence of a human being. She thought he was saying humans are uh, morally good, basically. But he had just said humans are sinners. So he wasn't saying that all humans are are um, necessarily morally good. He was, um, because he had just said all humans are sinners. So let's go to the end of her quote here. Yes, we are all made in the image of God. God loves us so much. God loves us so much. John 3, 16. Jesus did not die for plants and animals. He died for human beings that are made in God's image. Therefore, yes, we have inherent innate worth that no other creature in the universe has. That is all absolutely true. So she recognizes that humans are created good. But to say that we are all fundamentally good, that the heart is good, Pope Francis is not talking about that we are good creations made in God's image and therefore have value. She's assuming that that's not what Pope Francis meant. Pope Francis uh, very well might have meant that the goodness that is fundamental to all human beings originates back from their being created in the image of God um, because the manner in which we were created and designed by God, um, basically, according to Calvin, that original design has been utterly tarnished by sin. According to Catholic anthropology, that original good design has been very corrupted, but at the deepest core level has not become totally depraved. And so in the deepest level, we still remain good, even though we have become very damaged. And in practice, that means that we are all sinners. This is Court of Christianity, she wrote, because if everyone is basically good, the gospel is not good news. If the gospel is not good news, what's the point? So, uh, let's look at a few other objections before we start um, looking at what framework their views are coming from. Franklin Graham said, There is no place in the human heart or on the earth where sin hasn't wrought its deadly work, he writes. So he's referring to the idea of total depravity, that the entire human heart has been affected by sin, the entirety of it. Sin brought death, both physical and spiritual, to the entire human race. When you took your first breath outside your mother's womb, you were already a sinner, alienated and separated from a holy God. So he has this extreme over-interpretation of original sin that goes beyond the church's tradition, saying that the heart entirely has been damaged by sin. Um, this, these are the objections of Kurt Mulberg. So, are all humans fundamentally good? Is the heart itself good? Are we just a little bit rogue and sinful? Not according to the prophet Jeremiah, who said, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Or King Solomon, who mourned, The hearts of people, moreover, are full of evil, and there is madness in their hearts while they live. Or Jesus, who explained that it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. And then we name uh, different evil thoughts that can come out of the uh, person's heart. He does fail to say that it is also out of the heart that good things come. That comes from a different passage of the Gospels, which we'll look at in a moment. Or the Apostle Paul, who quoted the Psalms to emphasize his point. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who do does good, not even one. And now he continues to write, I am not a Catholic, so I do not pretend to know the official Roman Catholic interpretation of these texts, but I know there's a broad overlap between Catholics and Protestants on the doctrine of original sin. And that's true. Um, 
Calvinists take it heretically too far, though. According to both traditions, all humans have inherited a sin nature as a result of Adam and Eve's rebellion against God in the Garden of Eden. As a result, we are born with a propensity towards sin, are estranged from God, and are in a desperate need of salvation. One of the Catholic Church's great strengths down through the ages has been its defense of core doctrines like original sin. As early as the 5th century, for instance, a British monk called Pelagius denied original sin. He taught that the fall of Adam did not cause all humanity to inherit a sinful nature. I'm adding the word sinful, he wrote sin nature. And he stressed that humans are fundamentally free to live good lives without the intervention of divine grace. Uh, through a series of councils, Pelagianism was determined to be a heresy and has been rejected by Catholics and Protestants ever since. Oddly, Pope Francis's recent remarks appear to be summoning this ancient heresy. And that's preposterous. Pelagius denied original sin entirely. He did not believe in concupiscence or the transmission of any original damaged soul. He believed that sin was only imitated, but not um, transmitted or translated. So if you would like to pause this video, you can read all of Pelagius's actual, um, or this is a little article from the Catholic Encyclopedia from 1911 on Pelagianism, but um, just a few highlights here of things that Pelagius said, which is not at all what Pope Francis is saying, would be, he said, they are mad who assert that sin comes to us from Adam through translation. He considered it insane that we would inherit any sort of ancient sin from Adam. He also said, by faith alone, God justifies the conversion of the wicked. So interestingly, in Pelagius's system of justification, he believed in salvation by faith alone. And he is, once again, a heretic that this Protestant pastor was criticizing and accusing the Pope of being too similar to. Uh, he also said that the strength of a person's soul the moral strength of man's will, especially when aided by asceticism, was sufficient in itself to attain the loftiest ideal of virtue. The value of Christ's redemption was, in his opinion, limited to instruction and example. Okay, so uh, he believes that you can attain everlasting life through personal efforts, and Catholicism does not teach that. Okay, I have written right here um, that there is nothing in Pope Francis's thoughts here that are suggesting he believes salvation can be attained by the individual's effort alone. That goes completely against Catholic theology of soteriology. So in general, Protestant critics of these comments do not seem to comprehend his anthropological framework or adequate, adequately really propose a coherent alternative one. It seemed like in um, these criticisms we read that a series of Bible verses were given and Pope Francis's view of humanity was sort of straw manned. It would seem imprudent to assume that by saying that people are fundamentally good, Pope Francis was implying that he felt that people were not sinners in need of salvation because this would be completely heretical. The Catholic Church believes that salvation is attained by um, receiving grace from God. You cannot earned the life of God within you. It is an unmerited gift. But at the same time, we do have the ability to choose the good, and God does expect us to choose the good. But if this implies that our heart is still fundamentally capable of choosing the good, and still has goodness at its very core, because we all desire the good, a totally depraved heart would not be able to choose the good, or even able to really recognize it. So now, these are the actual words of John Calvin on his uh, anthropology of total depravity. And I've already described these ideas, but these are his actual words. If you do want to read them and not just listen to how I've interpreted them, you could pause the video here and, and read through this. I'll read some of the highlights of what he actually said. He said that once someone looks at their own soul, they, quote, find nothing to lift his heart to self-confidence. And he said... Uh, humans have nothing to themselves with which to direct their life aright. Okay, he also said that, quote, all parts of the soul were possessed by sin after Adam deserted the fountain of righteousness. He also said, quote, none of the soul remains pure or untouched by this mortal disease. For in his discussion of a corrupt nature, Paul not only condemns the inordinate impulses and appetites that are seen, but especially contends the mind is given over to blindness and the heart to depravity. 
And this is the big quote here. He said, human reason, therefore, neither approaches nor strive towards, nor even takes a stream a aim at this truth. To understand who the true God is or what sort of God he wishes to be toward us, flesh is not capable of such lofty wisdom as to conceive God and what is God's, unless it be illumined by the Spirit of God. So he believes that the mind is not able to see God or strive towards God even. He says we cannot strive towards God in our fallen state, and he also believes we do not have the ability to um, to be freed from depravity on our own. We are all sinners by nature. He thinks our very nature has become the nature of a sinner rather than the nature of a potential child of God. Therefore, we are held under the yoke of sin. Now, for this discussion, when we're talking about the soul and the heart and whether or not they are totally depraved or fundamentally good, we need to first really discuss what a spiritual soul possesses. According to the Catechism, paragraph 1711, we read that, Endowed with a spiritual soul, with intellect and with free will, the human person is from his very conception ordered to God and destined for eternal beatitude. He pursues his perfection in seeking what is true and good. So the Catechism and Catholic scholastic tradition identifies the spiritual nature of a person's soul as possessing an intellect and a free will. These are the two things that make up our spiritual faculties, intellect and free will. They are designed to know God and love God. The will loves, the intellect knows or sees. According to Calvin, the intellect and the free will have become totally depraved. The intellect cannot strive towards God towards seeing him, and the free will cannot um, strive towards doing the good. The will cannot choose the good freely. So that's the question here. Um, can the intellect still strive towards God? Can the will still choose freedom? Or is the will incapable of choosing good? And is the mind and the intellect incapable of knowing God? The doctrine of total depravity is connected with the doctrine of free will. Stating that a fallen soul is totally depraved indicates that it is totally incapable of choosing the good apart from grace, and therefore it does not possess free will, but is only passively submissive to whether or not God chooses to give it grace. This is why Calvinists believe in double predestination. The soul cannot choose good, the soul cannot choose faith, the soul cannot choose to learn or know or love God. The soul can only do so if God chooses to give it the grace to do so. And therefore, in the Calvinist system, God chooses those that go to heaven, and God chooses those he deprives of the grace to go to heaven, and we have no freedom. Um, we have no freedom to either choose him or reject him. We only have the ability to reject him, but sometimes God gives the grace to have us choose him instead. So now we're going to examine scripture and we're going to examine whether or not scripture shed light, sheds light on if human souls still have the capacity to be good and if human souls still have the capacity to choose God after the fall of Adam and Eve. So we turn to sacred scripture. Now, Satan's scripture, sacred scripture, excuse me, provides us with saving doctrine when read in the light of the Holy Spirit guided sacred tradition. Certain doctrines are made explicitly clear to virtually any reader, such as the existence of God. It's very hard to faithfully read the Bible, even as a Protestant, and deny the existence of God, or the salvific death of Jesus, for example. But, I mean, there are groups that have, you know, um, so you might have groups like Mormons or um, Jehovah's Witnesses who pick up the Bible and because they're not guided by the Holy Spirit, you know, sacred tradition, Holy Spirit inspired sacred tradition, they can come away with even the most basic doctrines that they started to disagree with, like the divinity of Jesus or um, even the, the, the monotheism, you know, Mormons can, can be sort of not even monotheistic. Certain doctrines, though, are not made explicitly clear, and so we're going to have a lot of disagreements with Christians that choose to reject the sacred tradition as handed down throughout the generations from the apostles. 
The specific state of the soul after original sin is not made explicitly clear in Scripture. There is no verse that says, for example, as a result of the fall of mankind, this is the precise theological manner in which souls were negatively affected, dot, dot, dot. We have to look at glimpses of how the soul is affected, and then we need to interpret those verses based on a certain tradition, which is an interpretive key for looking at scripture. We can choose whether we will accept the Catholic tradition, which has been passed down through the generations, or we can choose to accept the Protestant tradition, which was invented in the 16th century. We need to look at the accretion account first in order to understand the teleology or the ethical purpose and objective nature of mankind. Genesis chapter 1 and 2 sheds light on our fundamental nature because this is when we were created. Once again, the Bible is not going to say here's exactly the purpose of man and this is exactly what their nature is like, but it does give us um, the glimpse of the creation of man and tradition illuminates the rest of the way. Jesus Christ himself, when asked whether or not divorce was ever permissible, answered that question by referencing Genesis chapter 1 and 2. He said to the Pharisees, um, Have you not read that he who made man from the beginning made them male and female? And he said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall be in one flesh. So when our Lord answers this question about divorce, he goes back to the beginning because it points at the ethical purpose of mankind to be man and woman and being united in uh, binding marriage and matrimony that lasts until death that's a part of our nature and so he goes back to the beginning to answer this moral question so Genesis chapter 1 and 2 sheds all kinds of light on who we are in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 God said let us make man in our image and likeness and let him have dominion over the fishes of the sea the fowls of the air and the beasts and the whole earth and every creeping creature that moveth upon the earth. And God created man to his own image. To the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. And God blessed them, saying, Increase and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it. And rule over the fishes of the sea, and the fowls of the air, and all living creatures that move upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed upon the earth, and all trees that have in themselves seed of their own kind, to be your meat. And to all the beasts of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to all that move upon the earth, and wherein there is life, that they may feed, have to feed upon it. And it was done so. And God saw all the things he had made, and they were very good. As a creature, mankind was designed in the image and likeness of God, which tells us that mankind has a spiritual nature, for God is spirit, and mankind then has an intellect and a free will, even though we are also an animal. Human nature includes a complementarity of sexes between man and woman. Humanity was placed at the head of the entire physical universe, that's made very clear, and mankind was created ontologically very good. So Pope Francis would agree with all these points, um, and so would John Calvin. They both agree with the good creation or original intent of man. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 through 10, we read about the fall of man, and we read about how the souls of Adam and Eve were deformed into a state of sin, and how that state of sin and lack of grace was passed down to their descendants. Okay, Anthropological points we read from this passage. At the head of humanity, we have a sin of distrust and disobedience of God. Mankind pridefully and enviously grasped to God's divine authority and sought to possess it for themselves to judge between good and evil. All of their descendants, therefore, of Adam and Eve, would have a fear and distrust of God. Human souls were henceforth damaged. Because of the actions of our spiritual mother and father, Adam and Eve, we inherited a soul which was inclined toward a distrust of God, disobedience, pride and envy, and the desire to decide for oneself what was good and evil. The question between, you know, here Pope Francis and John Calvin and Catholicism and Protestantism is whether or not the damage caused by original sin left the spiritual human nature passed down by Adam and Eve in a state of total depravity, or if the soul was still capable of some natural goodness, which emanates from the fundamental goodness of the original design that God described as very good in the beginning. John Calvin would state that the damage caused by original sin left the spiritual elements of the human soul passed down by Adam and Eve totally depraved without any goodness in it, apart from the infusion of God's grace. Catholic tradition states that while um, the soul was corrupted, 
This stole still does possess some natural goodness, which emanates from the fundamental goodness of its original design. And while the soul is capable of natural virtue, once again, it is still utterly incapable of attaining sanctifying grace through personal merit, because the share in the life of God is acquired only through the unmerited gift of God, ordinarily transmitted through holy baptism. No matter how naturally good a person is, that does not give them sanctifying grace. That does not give them the life of God. These were the verses that um, that Ali Beth Stuckey said supported um, what she was describing, which was the theory of total depravity, even though she didn't like it being called that. Um, that is what she was subscribing to. If you don't believe humans are fundamentally good, you that's that's what that's why, because you believe humans are fundamentally depraved. So these are the verses she provided, as well as one that I added that also supports, you know, goes with this genre here. And Jesus said to him, why callest thou me good? None is good, but one that is God. So Jesus here is referring to the essence of goodness, which emerges from God. Um, Jesus was not saying that no one on this earth is good. Jesus did praise people um, like the Roman centurion for his faith. Uh, the woman who was begging for him to heal her daughter, he praised her for her faith as well. And um, so he did praise good qualities in people. And if you praise good qualities, you're recognizing goodness in them. But they're not, those, those people do not contain the essence of goodness, which is found in God. That's what he's saying here. John chapter 8, verse 34. Jesus answered them, Amen, Amen. I say unto you, that whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. So this is saying that if you commit sin, you become the slave of sin. When she quoted this verse, she only said, we are a slave of sin. She left out the part where Jesus said, the person who chooses to sin becomes a slave of sin. Because when we choose to sin as alcoholics or drug addicts know, the decision becomes much harder to stop sinning. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, the heart is perverse above all things and unsearchable who can know it. And so, yes, the heart can become a very dark place in the heart of a sinner. And the heart is very capable of evil. Ephesians, especially because of original sin, the original sin has made our hearts very dark places until the light of God illuminates them. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3, in which also we all conversed in time past in the desires of our flesh, fulfilling the will of the flesh and of our thoughts, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. So this is describing concupiscence, that we are all consumed by the desires of our flesh, and we are all pursuing our sins. We are more inclined to become sinful. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 through 24, For all have sinned and do need the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 19, And I will give them one heart, and will put a new spirit in their bowels, and I will take away the stony heart of their flesh, and will give them a heart of flesh. So yes, our hearts in general have become very stony because of sin. Something else she could have quoted would have been Psalm 51, verse 7, For behold, I was conceived in iniquities, and in sins did my mother conceive me. This verse by St. Uh, the King David is referring to original sin, that he was conceived in sin. In sins did my mother conceive me. Now, in Catholic tradition, we have no problem with any one of these verses, because, as we could say, according to the apostolic tradition, these verses demonstrate the fallen state of man's heart. But none of them indicate that the soul of a fallen man is totally depraved without any natural virtue or natural spiritual faculties to choose the good whatsoever. There are also other verses that refer to primordial or underlying goodness in the hearts of fallen men. So there are verses that say kind of the opposite of what these verses had said. Such as Genesis chapter 5, verse 23 through 24, we read about Enoch, um, who walked with God and was seen no more because God took him up into heaven. In Psalm 24, verse 3 through 4, we read, Neither let my enemies laugh at me, for none of them that wait on thee shall be confounded. Let all of them be confounded that act unjust things without cause. Show, O Lord, thy ways to me, and teach me thy paths. So it says, none of those people that wait for God shall be confounded. So it's saying that people can choose to, um, to be faithful and wait for God, and God will protect them. Uh, Psalm 9, verse 1, I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonders. So if the heart is capable of praising God, then it is a vehicle for doing good still. Proverbs 10, verse 8, The wise of heart will receive commandments, but a babbling fool will come to ruin. We're contrasting people who have a wise heart with 
those that have a bad heart, babbling fools. So Proverbs chapter, uh, Proverbs chapter 10 verse 8 is saying that some people can have a wise heart. Proverbs chapter 14 verse 30 says, A tranquil heart gives life to the flesh, but envy makes the bones rot. So if we have a tranquil heart, which is described as possible here in Proverbs chapter 14 verse 30, and the tranquil heart is not totally depraved, but it's a good heart, um, then we will have life in our flesh. Matthew chapter 12 verse 35 and Luke chapter 6 verse 35 say, the good person out of his good treasure brings forth good. Or uh, most trans, this is the Dewey Rems, most Bibles in modern English say, the good person out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good. And the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. So Jesus is contrasting those who have good hearts with those who have evil hearts. Luke chapter 8, verse 15, Jesus says, As for that in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patience. So Jesus is saying the good soil in the parable of the sower are those who receive the word in an honest and good heart. He is implying that people can have good hearts and they can receive the word, which can then bear fruit. So he's almost saying a good heart is a predisposition to allowing grace to be fruitful in your life. And that's the case for most people. You have to have a good heart in order to allow grace to take root, according to the parable in Luke chapter 8, verse 15. Finally and famously, we have the beatitude, blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. So Jesus is saying that some people can have pure hearts, and they are the ones who shall see God. Now, according to John Calvin, he could say to all these verses, according to my personal opinion, and not to a tradition which was handed down to me from the apostles, these verses all imply that these particular human hearts were made pure entirely by grace, because they were totally depraved upon conception and had no natural capacity for virtue left in them whatsoever. So both Catholics can look at these verses and say, yeah, those are all beautiful, good. Yep, that's true. Not beautiful, but you know, tragic, but they're all true. Calvin can look at all these verses and say, well, look at what God's grace has done. None of these hearts became pure on their own. You can use either anthropological system to interpret these sets of verses, and they can make sense. Um, the question is, which anthropological tradition is trustworthy? The one invented by a 16th century intellectual, or the one that is passed down by the church from all generations? And in this last part of the video here, we're going to look at, uh, basically, what did the church fathers seem to believe? Did they believe that the human heart was totally depraved and incapable of choosing good on its own? Or did they believe that free will played an essential role in our walk to God? If the church fathers believed in free will, that implies they did not believe in total depravity because they believed the heart was still capable of choosing good on the natural level. Okay. Um, no, and I... Uh, apologize, I misspoke. Before we look at the Church Fathers' quotes about free will, we'll look at the Gospels uh, and see if the Gospels seem to imply that deciding in our own free wills to do what is good was a major part of Jesus' instructions. Because if Jesus is frequently telling us to choose the good, that is implying he is stating that our hearts are capable of choosing the good and should be expected to choose the good rather than evil. We can begin with the precursor to the Messiah, John the Baptist. People asked him, what then shall we do? And he answering said to them, he that hath two coats, let him give to him that hath none. He that hath meat, let him do in like manner. And the publicans came also to be baptized, and they said to him, Master, what shall we do? But he said to them, Do nothing more than that which is appointed you. And the soldiers asked, also asked him, saying, And what shall we do? And he said to them, Do violence to no man, neither calumniate any man, but be content with your pay. John the Baptist is asking them in their freedoms to do a series of things to live an upright and virtuous life. These next three sides all are instances in which Jesus told us that we have to choose the good, implying we have a heart that is capable of choosing it. He said in John 14, 15, if you love me, obey my commands. Matthew 5, 48, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. He said in Matthew 7, 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven 
but only he who does the will of my Father. He also said, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. He said, Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So he's indicating that trees can bear good fruit. He also said, Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not and does them will be like a wise man who built his house upon rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house upon sand, and great was the fall of it. So he said a lot more instructions that were similar to this. He said that we have to um, choose him over even our families in Matthew chapter 10, verse 37 through 39. He said in Matthew 10:42. Whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he is my disciple, truly I say to you, he shall not lose his reward. So he's saying there will be reward based on our choices to serve the disciples. Matthew 11, verse 12, he said, Men of violence take the kingdom of God by force. He said uh, to take his yoke upon ourselves and taking a yoke upon yourself draws the image of a cattle working in a field. It's implying labor, and labor implies we have the ability to labor in our hearts and not just passively receive what God is giving us. But he's saying we must work by um, doing the work of God. He said, I tell you on the day of judgment, men will render account for every careless word they utter, for by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. So we will be judged based on all the words we say. If we were all totally depraved, we would not be responsible for the words we say because we wouldn't have any choice in the matter. He said in Matthew 12:50, whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. He said in Matthew 13, 41 and 40, through 43, that... Um, those that will be tormented in the hellfire will be those who are causes of sin and evil doers. Those who choose to do evil will be punished in hellfire. We already read Matthew 15, verse 10. Um, what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. What comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. Um, and then he lists the things that can come out of the heart. Thoughts, murders, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, and slander. These are things that defile us. Um, and that implies that we do not need to be defiled. We do not need to let those things emerge from our hearts. He said, he will repay every man for what he has done. Matthew 16, verse 27. He said also, um, you must choose to become like a little child. He said that people would be punished if they cause little ones to sin. In Matthew 18, verse 6. He says, if we do not forgive brothers from our hearts, we will not be forgiven either, indicating that our hearts are places where we can forgive. And if you want to pause it, you can read these final verses as well. But I hope you've seen that Jesus clearly implies choice is a very important part of our walk of salvation. We have free will in our hearts, and we are expected to use that free will to choose the good, and we will be severely punished for each instance in which we choose the evil, because we do have the freedom to choose between good and evil. The last judgment, Jesus indicates that we will be judged based on whether or not we serve the poor in which Jesus is found. So we are judged not whether or not he subjectively decided to give us grace or not, we will be judged based on what we chose to do or chose not to do. Finally, let's look at what the church fathers had to say on these topics. Did they believe the human heart was capable of choosing the good, or did they believe the, ca the human heart was incapable of choosing the good and was totally depraved? We begin with Pope Clement of Rome, who lived from 35 to 99 AD. He said, although we are born neither good nor bad, we become one or the other, and having formed habits, we are with difficulty drawn from them. So, he's not denying concupiscence, but he's saying that our enslavement to sin is a, is a result of our habits that we form by our choice. 
But inasmuch as inborn affection towards God the Creator is sufficient for salvation to those who love him, the enemy tries to pervert this affection in men and to render them hostile and ungrateful to their Creator. But if mankind would turn their affection towards God, all would doubtless be saved, even if, when they have some faults, they would be open to correction for righteousness. But now most of mankind have been made enemies of God, their hearts the wicked one has entered, and has turned aside towards himself the affection which God the Creator had implanted in them, which he, God, desires that they might have towards them, towards him. St. Clement is implying that we have an inborn affection towards God built into our hearts in our, in our very human nature. And he's saying that this alone could lead us to God, but the devil often um, corrodes away this inborn affection. St. Ignatius to the Magnesians said, I do not mean to say that there are two different human natures, but all humanity is made the same, sometimes belonging to God and sometimes to the devil. If anyone is truly spiritual, they are a person of God. But if they are irreligious and not spiritual, then they are a person of the devil, made such not by nature, but by their own choice. And so the wickedness of one who becomes a grave sinner is not the nature that someone is born with. It is created by their choice. This is not Pelagianism. But someone could be conceived without original sin, and through their choice, they could choose to pursue God, and they would strive towards God, and by his grace, he could invite them into heaven. But when he's saying that some people belong to the devil, he's saying that they were not conceived belonging to the devil. Sure, they were conceived without original, without sanctifying grace, but it was their own choices that then made them, um, you know, fill the holes in their hearts with sins and idolatry. St. Justin Martyr said, he lived from 100 to 165 AD. In the beginning, God made the human race with the power of thought and of choosing the truth and doing right, so that all men are without excuse before God, for they have been born rational and contemplative. So he's saying that we all have the, the, the power of thought and the power of choosing the truth and rightness. So we all have that power in our nature, he said. For God, wishing both angels and men who were endowed with free will and at their own disposal to do whatever he had strengthened each to do, made them so, that if they chose the things acceptable to himself, he would keep them free from death and from punishment, but that if they did evil, he would punish each as he sees fit. So he's again saying that both angels and men were created with free will, and so we have each made our own beds and that our eternal fates are our own choice. St. Polycarp, disciple to St. John the Evangelist, said, But if some had been made by nature bad and others good, these later would not be deserving of praise for being good, for such were they created, nor would the former be reprehensible, for thus they were made originally. But since all men are of the same nature, are able both to hold fast and to do what is good, and on the other hand, having also the power to cast it from them and not to do it, some do justly receive praise even among men who were under the control of good laws, and much more from God, and obtain deserved testimony of their choice of good in general, and of persevering then it, therein. Uh, but the others are blamed, and receive a just condemnation, because of their rejection of what is good and fair. And therefore the prophets used to exhort men to what was good, to act justly and to work righteousness, as I have so largely demonstrated, because it is in our power so to do and because by excessive negligence we might become forgetful, and thus stand in need of that good counsel which the good God has given us to know by means of the prophets. So he's indicating that it's not that some people are given a bad nature and some a good one, which Calvinism would just say that everyone is given a bad nature. He says that if we were all given a bad nature, then nobody would be considered reprehensible for sinning. Uh, but because we all have the same nature and we have the ability to hold fast to do what is good. He says we have that ability, which means he does not believe in total depravity, though we also have the power to cast goodness from ourselves and not to do it. So this is why he says some can be praiseworthy and some could be reprehensible. If then it were not in our power to do or not to do these things, what reason had the apostle, Paul, and much more the Lord himself to give us counsel to do some things and to abstain from others? But because man is possessed of free will from the beginning, and God is possessed of free will, in whose likeness man was created, advice is always given to him to keep fast the good, which thing is done by means of obedience to God. St. Clement of Alexandria said, To obey or not is in our power, 
provided we do not have the excuse of ignorance. So he thinks we do have the power to obey or not. And he also said believing and obeying are in our own power, indicating our soul's intellect and free will are still in our own power. Tertullian, the teacher of St. Cyprian of Carthage, said, I find then that man was constituted free by God. He was master of his own will and power, for a law would not be imposed upon one who did not have it in his power to render that obedience which is due to law. Nor again would the penalty of death be threatened against sin. If a contempt of the law were impossible to man in the liberty of his will, man is free with a will either for obedience or resistance. Methodius of Olympias said, I say that God, purposing to honor man in this manner and to grant him an understanding of better things, has given man the power of being able to do what he wishes. So we do have that power. He said, he commends the use of his power for better things. However, it is not that God deprives man again of free will. Rather, he wishes to point out the better way. For the power is present with man, and he receives the commandment. But God exhorts him to turn his power and choice to better things. I do not think God urges man to obey his commandments, but then deprives him of the power to obey or disobey. He does not give a command in order to take away the power that he has given. Rather, he gives it in order to bestow a better gift, in return for his rendered obedience to God. For man had power to withhold it. I say that man was made with free will. Because there is nothing evil by nature, key point there, there is nothing evil by nature, but it is by use that evil things become such. So I say, says he, that man was made with a free will, not as if there were already evil in existence, which he had the power of choosing if he wished, but on account of his capacity of obeying or disobeying God. This is just the same quotes. Finally, one final point to make. In Catholic tradition and in classical uh, Greco-Roman philosophy, there stand four cardinal virtues of courage, justice, wisdom, and temperance or moderation. You can pause and read the definitions if you're not familiar with those four cardinal virtues. According to Catholic tradition, these cardinal virtues are um, things that all human beings are capable of acquiring through human effort. That's from Catechism of the Catholic Church 1804. And so the church believes that through human effort alone, the heart can foster these four virtues. And so you can find these virtues amongst all the nations of the earth and all of even non-Christians throughout the earth though it is far more difficult to develop these virtues without grace, it is possible by the state of the heart after original sin to develop these four cardinal virtues. The theological virtues of faith, hope, and love are attainable only through grace. Catechism 1812 says these virtues have the one and triune God for their origin, motive, and object. And so it is these three theological virtues which are the crowning jewels of the human soul, while the four cardinal virtues are what prepares the soul to receive the seed of the word of God and bear fruit. Once we have these four cardinal virtues, we are able to bear fruit of faith, hope, and love, which makes us truly saintly uh, and, and, and truly in the complete form that we were originally designed to be in Eden. To review. Recent papal comments regarding the fundamental goodness of human beings have drawn controversy between those who subscribe to the ancient, or not the ancient, excuse me, the um, hundreds of year old Protestant anthropology of John Calvin of total depravity. So those that believe the soul was totally corrupted by sin do not believe we are fundamentally good. Those that believe sin corrupted us but did not totally deprave us believe that at our most fundamental level, we are still good. I hope that we've seen through our examination of scripture and the church fathers that as it is a clear theme of scripture that our souls still are free to know God and to pursue him and to choose the good and to choose love. Since that's such a common theme throughout the scriptures and the church fathers, it is clear that the human heart as described in scripture can be a heart that is pure and wise and peaceful. And so it is not doomed to be depraved unless there is grace, but it is still capable of striving towards God, though it is still in need of the sanctifying grace, one on the cross, in order to attain the bliss of, uh, of eternal life. 
We'll finish with a prayer that all things said here can glorify God. In nomine Patri et Filio et Spiritui Sancto. Gloria Patri et Filio et Spiritui Sancto, sicut erat in principio et nunc et semper, et in secula seculorum. Amen. Okay, I submit everything I've said to the judgment of Holy Mother Church and the providence of the Holy Spirit. God bless you, and see you next time. Bye-bye.